How's everybody doing? Thanks for uh, inviting me to come speak. Uh, I work with Pivotal, and um, this is a picture of me at work. These are some of the companies I've worked with in the past, some of the projects that I've, that, that I've contributed code to. Uh, this is a picture of me when I'm actually doing work. Um, so again, uh, it's great to be here. Can you use this one? This This one. OK. Is that better? Uh, so Sergio, there is a, OK, good enough. So I haven't been around the scene as long as John. Um, I, I started getting close to DevOps around 2010. So I wanted to take the opportunity to kind of speak about what it means to me, uh, what, I, what I feel that it started as, and, and kind of some of the things that I've noticed and how it's changed. Um, it's become more formalized. Uh, we have food now, which is awesome. Uh, they give us coffee, which is great. Um, and it, but it, it's, it's, I think it's important to, to kind of recognize the spirit of, of where all of this came from um, that you know, kind of populated all over the world. Um, so I wanted to take a minute and talk about what it, what it means to me. Um, this is basically a quick agenda. Um, you know, I think that whenever I think about DevOps, I actually think about this guy. Uh, he is, uh, his name is Joseph Schumpeter, he was born in 1883, and he made a very, a very famous um, uh, document that was published on capitalism, socialism, and democracy in, in 1942. And uh, he's, he's best known for his publications on free market economies. And I think that really, for me, this guy uh, kind of summed up really the root of what, what DevOps started as. Um, so I kind of want to take a moment and speak to that. So what he's most famous in quoting is, is the gale of creative destruction. And in essence, what this means is that uh, you know, creative destruction is, is something that occurs when something newer kills something older. And you know, this is, is uh, you know, as he put it, it's, it's free market's messy way of delivering progress. He originally got this idea from uh, you know, it per pertaining to economics from observing biological systems. When, when something comes in, it destroys an older one, and there is a sense of progress through this, this uh, process of destruction. And, and one of the biggest things that, that he was really profound in, in addressing to people is that a new era begins at the demise of another. And we, we can see how this, this populates through, um, you know, and, and this is the idea that that I feel that DevOps days was really born out of, right? It, it wasn't initially specific to DevOps. It was specific to people who all had problems that they didn't have a clear path on how to solve. And there were competitive advantages that could be realized by figuring out how to solve those problems. And that the, the people who were first to solve those problems were able to recognize that in the state of business that they were operating in. And, and, and you know, if we look at, we can see this repeat itself throughout history. Um, you know, normally, whenever I make a quote about seeing something repeat throughout history, I, I try to look outside of U.S. history um, because it's there's not that much of it, relatively speaking. So, um, you know, I, I I try to look at companies who have a real history. So, if we look at, for instance, a Chinese example, because Chinese, if it's one thing they have, it's history. So. We look at the Han Dynasty, 500 BC, right? First crossbow. Crossbows emerge. We have a weapon, right? And this remained the state of how people killed each other for 1,500 years. After 1,500 years, we discovered gunpowder. And this was really uh, something that really wasn't actioned on for a while, right? I mean, for the next 300 years, people continued to kill each other with crossbows and they had celebration parties with fireworks. And it really didn't evolve much, much past that. Um, but about 300 years later, uh, we saw the first handgun emerge. And this is really where the whole creative destruction in this value chain, so to speak, uh, where, this, where this really emerges. So right around the same time, um, you know, the Chinese are trying out their new handgun. State of warfare is interesting. And we have the Mongols, who were you know, very famous for killing everybody in battle. And around that same time, that the Chinese actually defeated the Mongols in battle. 
right? And because the Mongols had no gunpowder. So, you know, the, so 100 years later, to reflect on where this is going, uh, we see the Mongols selling gunpowder to Europe. So this is the quick history lesson that uh, you know, kind of covers off one of my bullet points in the agenda. But I think that the lesson in all of this is actually really simple, right? If we look at this through the lens of creative destruction, and that's that, you know, you, you really want <laughs> that it's, it sounds simple, right? And, and everything in history always sounds simple because you're looking at it as a reflection. So it, it's easy to say, well, of course, that was the way that things were, were going to go. And, uh, you know, but, but the, 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 the key trend that you can see that always survives through history is that whatever was the focus on the business value or warfare or whatever it was that you were trying to, 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 to accomplish, if you, if you take a moment to understand what the focus should be and what adds the most value to your mission, then that's where your focus should be and that's what will help you win, right? And I think that that's the underlying concept that really inspired a lot of the DevOps days, the, or the early DevOps days, right? Beyond just vendor conversations and product talks and technology talks, it was really an open discussion around people who had these problems. And they were looking for different ways to solve these problems. So if we fast forward a quick 600 years, um, and we look at some cases of, of you know, what modern day gunpowder um, you know, stories that we have, right? And I'm gonna touch on uh, you know, this bookstore, uh, which I know this conversation has become incredibly commoditized, so I'm not gonna dwell on it. Um, but you know, we all know, we all seen the, the Amazon story, we understand how uh, you know, they, 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 they put a lot of you know, Borders and Barnes and Nobles and, and all of these other bookstores, the traditional retail models out of business. And this was um, a very real example of creative destruction in the marketplace, right? I mean, they, they saw a new way of doing things, uh, you know, gunpowder emerged, people grabbed hold of it, and the existing order began to die. And it was being replaced by the new order, the new way of doing things, right? So, and I think that the key takeaway in all of this is that, you know, Amazon, when you look at, at, at their roots, right, this is, is pre-2006, pre-advent of AWS, when they were really a bookstore trying to figure out how to sell books. Um, the, the thing that really enabled their, their uh, entry into this disruption was, was the fact that Amazon, as a culture, as a company culture, never, never, they never saw themselves as a bookstore. They saw themselves as a technology company that happen to sell books. It's like we have to get a paycheck from somewhere, so we're going to sell books. But really, we're a technology company. Like we we identify ourselves as a tech company, and this is really what enabled them to to initiate this path, right? So, you know, when they came out, Amazon had a huge level of competition. I mean, there was, uh, you know, there was Walmart, for instance, right? So if we look at the current numbers on Walmart. If Walmart were a country, they would be the 28th largest GDP in the world. Um, they are actually one level above Austria for our Austrian friends in the room. Um, and they're just behind Norway, right? They have 11,000 stores in 27 countries, 2.2 million people, right? They, are, they employ as many people worldwide as the Chinese army and actually the Defense Department of the US. So these are like, you could not pick uh, a, 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 a worse competitor if you were thinking, I'm going to disrupt this industry by making a website that sells books, right? But yet they did, right? So that's, that's an important thing to, to, to reflect on. I mean, Walmart sells a, a billion pounds of bananas a year, right? And the funniest part is that if we look at, even in the fact that they sell a billion pounds of bananas a year, their key products are teen sportswear, Halloween candy, and yarn. So. <laughs> That's interesting, right? I mean, this last year they earned $45 billion in revenue and they outpaced number two worldwide, which was Exxon, and they outpaced them by $103 billion. So if we look at this bookstore or this technology company that happened to sell books and we look at where they're at now, right? Um, you know, this is the latest stock information. So you can see that it's, they've been basically running away with it since 2008 and this started by them looking at a new way of doing things. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was, they discovered gunpowder. That's really what, what it is, right? And if you see 
the latest news that's, that's out over this past week about Walmart, um, you can see the stock dropped, They're, you know, the company's in, in a lot of trouble, right? So a small bookstore that had the spirit of being a technology company that sold books was able to come into a market as a complete unknown and disrupt a company that basically had a, a global lock on this segment of retail, employed as many people as the Chinese military does, and they were able to disrupt them on this level. And here lies the, you know, what, what, what's referred to as the paradox of progress, right? And, and the, the, the uh, you know, the, the irony of this is, is that, you know, lost jobs, uh, vanishing industries, market turmoil, ruined companies, unemployment, change. Like these are, these are inherent parts of a growth system, just like they are in biology, right? Process and pain are, are inextricably linked. You can't have one without the other, right? There's, there's, you know, process cannot exist without accepting that some people are going to be worse off in this process. And that they might be worse off, you know, in, in a temporary setting, they might be worse off forever. And that's, that is just, uh, that is just the reality of progress. There's, there's no, you can't change that. It's, it's something that you have to accept. That creative destruction is real, and the only thing that you can really do is to acknowledge that and accept it, right? So Amazon, in this, is, is not a unique story. Um, you know, we have a lot of, of, of similar cases that are happening right now. Um, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of the people remember these companies on the left. Uh, you know, traditional travel agencies being, everything is moving onto the internet. There were people working in all of these companies, right? And, and I think the, the takeaway is, is that not only does this disruption happen, and you know, it, it, it's unfortunate that people lose their jobs and that there's all this change that's going on and all this turmoil and uh, you know, this volatility, but these failures are good. Um, you know, these failures should be embraced and expected. And, and because out of these failures results in something better, right? And this cycle repeats itself. And, you know, when we, when we, we come to DevOps days and we talk about, uh, you know, how systems react on tops of servers and how all these things, and, you know, common thing when moving into cloud, how, you know, you'll hear people talking about how, you know, software services and applications should assume failure. And I think it's important to note that, that people should also assume failure. And, and people should also gracefully assume failure, just like the systems that they're working on, right? And, and you know, these are all modern day examples of that creative destruction. And the best way for people to really gracefully assume failure is for them to be informed in a, in a group that, that is discussing where the disruption is going to take place so that you are on the right side of that disruption. I mean, everybody would rather be working at one of these companies on the right. So this is, a, this is an important, you know, it's an important part of, of DevOps days. And, you know, there's no doubt that as Amazon identified themselves as a software company or as a technology company that happened to sell books, uh, a lot of other companies have adopted this model, right? I mean, Silicon Valley companies are disrupting traditional industries and they are they're generating tremendous value right so you know we've all heard people talk about how you know uber has no cars airbnb has no hotels facebook doesn't generate any content but it's the largest you know content source in the world amazon has no retail stores how software is eating the world I and mean, we've, we've we've heard these things um you know and and, and it's it's uh and it is not unique to any of these companies like we're seeing this across every market every every market that is catering to industrial era companies brick and mortar companies if they are not already being disrupted they are ripe for disruption and the only way that we're really seeing that is through uh, those companies regarding software and technology as a first-class citizen in their company right I mean Tesla you know I think is a very interesting story I mean we've been We've been working with a lot of automotive companies at, at, at Pivotal, and um, you know it, they are threatening the entire automotive industry at large. And we had a conversation with one of the largest automotive companies in the world, and you know this is a, a CIO conversation, and he was absolutely blown away and terrified by Tesla. And, and his comment was that 
all of this time, they have been trying to figure out how to put more computers into a car. And then out of nowhere, this Silicon Valley company, technology company, builds a laptop that you can drive. <laughs> Never saw that coming, right? It has a battery. It has a 4G connection. It updates itself on demand. You have continuous delivery right to the cockpit of the car. Like, not the way that they were thinking about this at all. And it's going to take all of these companies years just to catch up to where Tesla is right now with regards to software, to regards to building that software, how they're deploying it, supply chain management, how, they, how the internals of those companies work, right? I mean, it, it is, it is a, uh, you know, it's an interesting phenomenon to see how, how these companies are being disrupted, right? And, and the, you know, the, the core of it is really that, that software is changing, right? I mean, the way that, the way that we build software is changing. Um, you know, the monolithic, you know, people are starting to, to understand very well the problems with, you know, deploys and how frequently those deploys can be. And, you know, the pains of monolithic applications. And there's pains with microservices as well, but um, it allows the business to move faster. We're looking at things like, you know, 12-factor apps. Uh, you know, the guys at Netflix have been amazing at, at allowing a lot of these other industries or these other enterprises to stand on the shoulders of these giants who have, who have done this, this heavy lifting. Um, and the ways that we're deploying software has changed. The tooling that we're using to deploy it. A lot of this is, is, is great, and it's great progress. But the, the real message is, is that the companies who are really disrupting these markets are not losing sight of the business value that these tools bring to their business. Right? Like if you can, if you can focus on what will enable you to disrupt whatever industry you're in, then that deserves as much focus as you can get as you can give it, right? Not to, to be distracted on the things that are, you know, awesome engineering things to be working on, but they, they can divert you from the real path of disruption. Um, so if we look at, you know, software is changing, markets are changing, uh, you know, the other thing that's pretty interesting is that the competitive landscape is changing. Competition itself is changing, right? And this is, this is something that's, that's very interesting. So, you know, there, I was in a conversation with, um, you know, somebody that's at a bank, right? And it's a large bank. And we're there, they were talking about how, you know, prior to, or, you know, before a lot of this was being acknowledged inside of their bank, they were under the impression that another bank was their competition. And they realized that the biggest competition that they have is not another bank. People are engaging with their bank significantly more than they ever have because your bank is in your pocket. Like, how many people in this room have visited a bank teller in the last month? One, and you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> you just wanted to be one. <laughs> so, <laughs> did you just move somewhere and you set up a bank account and you're never gonna go back there? Is that the case here? So, you know, but, but people check their bank accounts. The metrics that they have for banks that are building these services and they're interacting with their bank accounts, people are checking their bank accounts as much as 100x more often than when you had to go to an ATM or a teller to check your bank account. Banks weren't prepared for this. Capacity plans weren't prepared for this. The whole way that they had envisioned the market reacting and, and the, the, the experience that they were giving to their customers was way off. Right? What banks, what this bank had realized, and what banks are realizing, is that, that banks are not leaving their bank to go to another bank because another bank has a better interest rate. Right? That, 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 that model is dead. It doesn't exist anymore. Right? When, when they started to understand why this, you know, people that were with this bank decided to leave this bank and move their money over to this bank, you know, they, they, they knew that people rarely have two banks. They do all their banking with one bank, right? The threat ended up being where they were not under threat by another bank because of an interest rate. They were under threat. They found out people were leaving because the competitive landscape for that bank was Facebook and Twitter and every application that's installed on your phone. People are engaging with their bank through their mobile app, right? You get used to a, a user experience that you have on your mobile app. You get used to using Facebook and Twitter and companies that do this stuff right. 
and then you use a bank, and it feels like the application that you're engaging with your bank through was made a decade ago by a marketing division who's responsible for creating brochureware. They know nothing about UX design, but they were tasked with leading this mobile strategy within this bank, right? And they found out that the reason why people were leaving bank A and going to bank B was because the app sucked. They were used to, they had a high bar that was set by all of the other apps on this phone. And that application was a pain point. It was something that was in their pocket and frustrated them. And then they see somebody else with a different bank, they love the app, they change. It's actually quite easy to change. The app enables you to do that. So, you know, that's, that is, you know, a, a very clear case of, of, you know, software really disrupting not only, uh, you know, the speed that you can deploy something or, you know, how quickly you can iterate or how quickly you can ship or getting more refined data that you can use for other business channels. But it, it, it really is a, uh, a stab at how, you know, the typical marketing landscape is, 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 uh, is changing. So let's take another look at this technology company that happened to sell books. Um, so, you know, we see another case here, same company, another case of creative destruction. Uh, you know, this is, this is also interesting because, you know, when Amazon AWS launched in, in, in 2006, they were very explicit about how, you know, they, this was the way they built their infrastructure. Everything had an API. Uh, the software that they had deployed for the shopping cart was written in microservices. Everything, you know, communicated from those services down through their APIs. They had this whole application architecture that was designed to run on their infrastructure. And there was a contract in place. Like this software architecture, this application architecture worked with this infrastructure. And that really ended up being forgotten or, or not really acknowledged, right? And, you know, we saw a lot of, of traditional ITs, you know, shops that were threatened by this. Uh, hardware vendors were threatened by this. Uh, telcos were threatened. Because if we look back at the timeline of how all this was evolving, this happened whenever telcos were looking to reinvent themselves. People weren't making international phone calls. They were using Skype. People weren't sending SMSs. They were using WhatsApp or WeChat, right? This drastically affected the top line of every telco. Telcos do, and it, okay, so at the same time, Amazon was launching regions inside of those telco facilities. Cages owned by the telco, leveraging the pipes of the telcos. Telcos looked at this and said, their growth is insane, they're obviously making money, why can't we do this, right? So a number of these telcos, they do what they do best, they called their vendors. And they said, we want an Amazon product. We want to become AWS, right? And, and they all called their vendors. So what this did was, it caused every vendor to be like, we don't have a cloud strategy. We need a cloud strategy like next week. So they looked around and they all came to the same conclusion. They all contributed one line of code to OpenStack. They got it accepted. They put the OpenStack logo on their web page and they have a cloud strategy, right? Fast forward. So, and that's, and that's what it was, right? And this fueled explosive growth into the infrastructure as a service layer. Cloud became a buzzword. Nobody really knew what it meant because it, it, was, a, it was stamped onto so many different products. It, in all of this infrastructure as a service chaos, people forgot that half of this contract was, was never fulfilled, right? The, 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 the whole application architecture, the microservices, the things that allowed AWS or to, to allow Amazon.com, the, the, the e-commerce store to be disruptive was, was never, half of that was forgotten, right? And that's, so this is basically where we're at, right? We have, uh, you know, a lot of people that did listen to Amazon and they, they, uh, they, they, but they loved the, the hype and they loved, they were enamored by the passion around infrastructure as a service, but they had these, these old, they had these five, 10 year old legacy apps <laughs> and they forklifted them up onto AWS, right? So we've ended up with this, you know, like infrastructure imbalance as a service. <laughs> and a lot of these, you know, legacy Java apps, they're very stateful, they write to disk, they, and they are less stable, they're less performant. They, they should really have just been left in a data saver cage running on metal where they were actually designed to run, right? They're not, they're not adding any value to that business by being in the cloud or being on OpenStack. But this is like the, the vendor lie, right? Because a vendor's not gonna tell, a vendor's gonna, every time you bring up 
microservices, they're going to say, let's talk about OpenStack because we know how to monetize that. Right? That's, the, that's where the conversation always routes into. So, but cloud from Amazon, when they launched AWS, cloud was always intended to be, to be more than infrastructure as a service. There was a contract that was supposed to be maintained. There was a blueprint in how their vision or their philosophy of technology was implemented in a way that allowed them to be disruptive, right? So, so I mean, I believe that the next real wave of creative destruction that we're looking at is, is really around that application layer. I mean, that's my, that's my personal opinion because it hasn't evolved. Not, not on the scale that infrastructure has, right? So if we look at this, right, and, and, and we look at where this is at, I mean, these are the people that are doing it right, right? These are the people that are actually making disruptive moves in their markets, and they're upsetting these industries. I mean, and you know, a lot of these companies, they need to start asking themselves, you know, microservice models here. I mean, you can see how busy Netflix, obviously killing it. Um, you know, in your company, do you have your pizza box team, two pizza box teams? Are they working on small services? You know, have you forgotten half of this cloud contract that was defined in 2006, right? I mean, are you, are you actually unlocking the, the value for the money that you spent in your infrastructure as a service layer, right? Like that's the question that, that a lot of these companies need to be asking themselves. Some companies have spent enormous budgets on OpenStack. I was involved in a lot of them. Um, Sean's laughing. <laughs> um, you know, I was, you know, it, it is, it is mind boggling to me. About. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I remember. Um, it's amazing to me how much money has been spent on OpenStack and how almost no money has been spent on teams that are actually acknowledging that they need to build software that was designed to run on that infrastructure, right? So, you know, things like how fast you can move are incredibly relevant, right? And you need to be thinking about how, um, you know, how, how you can deliver that at the speed you need to deliver it to join these people, right? So, you know, does your software remind you of this? Everybody in the company, when you, when you think of the software that's running on top of your infrastructure as a service, is it this, right? Or is it this? This guy, this guy is not moving very fast, right? Like if he makes a wrong turn, it takes him a long time to get back on track, right? So I mean, that's, that's, this is, you know, so this is the old era. This is the, this is the way that, you know, that, that things were done. Right? I mean, pre-2006, before people had an idea of, of, of how these things were supposed to be done. Um, you know, the new era begins at the demise of another. And we're seeing this with Netflix. We're seeing this with these companies. Right? So we need, to, we need to acknowledge that microservices and this application architecture, this services type model, this has always been at the center of Silicon Valley companies who are really disrupting these markets. Right? I mean, moving a hippo into the cloud does not solve your problem. That's the, that's the core of the message, right? I mean, you end up with all of these companies that, that will show up at events and they talk about how awesome their infrastructure is, um, but their software sucks. Like all of their apps are 10 years old, but their infrastructure is awesome. And the business is seeing almost no value in that, right? So, you know, how is this really being fixed, right? And, and you know, a, a, a big reason why you know, I, I ended up wanting to join Pivotal and why I annoyed the shit out of James Waters to hire me was, um, you know, because I see that the, the, the space that, 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 that's being operated right now, it's very much a software story, right? And I mean, here's two projects built on open source, you know, Spring Cloud, you know, we're leveraging, you know, a lot of the success of, of, of guys like Netflix who have contributed a lot of, of their, you know, circuit breakers and a lot of their, their patterns and tools and methodologies of how these types of things have been implemented to help add a prescriptive nature for companies to get to the things that add the focus on their business value, right? I mean, it, it's, it's people, engineers tend to not like prescriptive things. They feel that it locks them in to not having the freedom to, to, to pick the technologies that they like. And I agree with that, right? But, you know, if you're looking at it from where it delivers value, you need to think, is my time best spent? If I'm working on this, I'm not working on this, right? And that, that equation, you need to take that into account as well. So, 
if we look at you know Cloud Foundry, which I'm you know fully in support of, obviously, uh, you know these are the people who have kind of you know been bitten by the snowflake. They've tried to roll their own. They've 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 come full circle, and you know they have recognized that the the lessons learned by all of us are are better than by some of us. So there's a, a collective here of people that have this prescriptive idea. These are all people who are actively contributing. These are companies that are using it, right? I mean, we have Baidu serving over a billion page views a day. So it's, it's, it's out there and it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's been an excellent way for companies to really focus on building on top of that platform to where they can invest their energy into building software and defining what that software looks like and quickly iterating on that software to enable them to be disruptive, right? I mean, that lesson in operations of avoiding snowflakes has been already learned, right? If we rewind back to when, you know, Puppet first launched and then everybody was talking about iClassify and or that was the popular argument. And then after that, everything came over to, to Chef and Chef and Puppet rule the world and CF Engine was feeling forgotten. and you know, everything was evolving in that space. The big walk away lesson with that is that you don't want a thousand servers that are all slightly different. Like you want to have that everything be the same, right? And, and if we look from there and we look farther up the stack, right? I mean, the way that cloud is really being discussed in the market, um, you know, it, it, it's become a marketing term, right? Everybody associates their products to it. Uh, it, it, you know, most of the products that people have, they don't assume failure. So when I when I reflect back on, you know, the spirit that DevOps Days was founded in, it's not it's not a marketing term. It's not a it's not a conversation about a specific set of technologies. It's about you know people that are coming together to discuss the problems that are most relevant to to their business, to what they have, to staying employed, to not dying, right? And figuring out where that curve is. And what side of that curve is the curve that you want to be on, right? I mean, DevOps Days was, was born out of this idea of creative destruction, where people knew that old ways are going to die, and you should expect that. And all that you can really do is make sure that you're on the right side of it. And all of the discussions that have been happening yesterday and today are, are, are you know, they're, they're proof of that, right? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an event of gathering you know, these, these, these innovators and these people together and help them stay out of, you know, ahead of the trend. So really the way I see it is that, you know, we're like this tribe that is not part of the main vendor stream. Um, and, you know, in, a, in, a, in a, an ironic way, um, that, that this tribe, the people who are here discussing the next generation of, of technology and the next generation of innovation, this is the tribe that, you know, that, that unleashes lost jobs and, vanishing industries and market turmoil and change and ruined companies and unemployment. And this is the tribe that, that unleashes that on markets because this is the tribe that is first to fix those problems that creates the compelling, the competitive advantages for those companies that are offering, right? So, so we come together at these events and you know, we discuss these ideas and how people are fixing the ideas and we look for these solutions and they, these conversations are happening here long before they're happening with analysts, long before a vendor has a logo on them, right? And that keeps everybody that is part of this tribe ahead of that creative destruction, right? So that the people here, they have the history. When destruction happens, that's a good thing because we can all go get better jobs because we were prepared for it as people we gracefully assumed failure that we should be expecting, right? So this is happening more and more as industrial age companies are recognizing that they're being disrupted and they need to look for digital strategies. They need to do what Amazon did twice, right? This is happening in every industry. So, you know, software is, in my opinion, software is the story. This is what touches the business. This is what touches customers. This is, uh, you know, what, what is most relevant. This is the, the right side of, of, of this, the, 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 this the, the right side of history for this wave of creative destruction, right? And that there are tools available that allow you to stand on the shoulders of these giants. You know, that slide earlier. Netflix, they understand how to write distributed services. 
You know, uh, 10 years ago, I got up on stage and I took the position that the world should be rewritten in Erlang. And I, to some degree, stand by that, but I got laughed off stage and it took people years to forget I said that. So, and I'm not even a Java guy, right? I don't even really like Java that much, but the things that I've seen in Spring Cloud, the, the bigger question becomes architectural patterns. How are you preventing cascading failures? How are you, how much reinventing of the, what, what's already there do you want to do? Or do you want to leverage the tools that are proven? The thing that I like, I think Erlang sucks. I think Erlang OTP is awesome, right? I see you guys like, I don't know, you, you gave me the big like cheers in the back when I said Erlang was awesome. Now you probably hate me, but Erlang OTP <laughs> is awesome. Erlang is a language, uh, parse a string, makes me want to cut myself. So, you know, the message is really is, is stand on the shoulders of giants, leverage what's there, focus on what is important, and, and you know, don't die. Like, assume failure gracefully, right? So, you know, I got to close this off on the little, like, few minutes over time, and I just want to say, you know, my name is Jason. I, uh, I do things for Pivotal. Um, destruction is coming. We are, I am always hiring. If you're awesome with software and microservices and stuff, I definitely want to talk to you. So, uh, you know, definitely get at me, right? Thank you very much for your time.